It's 2013, Thatcher is dead, Daft Punk are alive, and Spike Jones made this movie without consulting me first. In a lot of ways, it's a pretty golden year, not least of all for PC tech. Some of this year's releases will remain relevant for a lot longer than you might have expected based on past experience. It wouldn't hurt you to visit your 2003 PC every now and again, you know. She worries about you. Last year's 2012 era build started pretty strongly, but petered out towards the late 2010s. This year, I'm going to throw in some 2013 era upgrades to see for how long the sex machine can still perform. In case you missed the last two videos in this series, here's a quick catch up on the sex machine story so far. I picked up the original build on CEX's site early last year for about £220. The nature of CEX is that, beyond the basic specs, everything's a bit of a mystery. All I knew to expect was an i7-3820, 24GB of RAM and a GTX 670. What turned up was a 2012-era custom build, with a Gigabyte X79 UD3 motherboard, a Corsair TX650 PSU, a 120GB SSD and 1TB hard drive, a Cooler Master Half 912 case, and about a decade's worth of accumulated dust. After some care and attention, I tested out this refurbished sex machine in a series of era-appropriate games and found it could hold its own. In more recent titles, however, there were issues. The quad-core CPU and quad-channel yet slow DDR3 RAM weren't especially limiting factors on their own, but the GTX 670 graphics card, a minor powerhouse in its day, struggles with VRAM, driver and API compatibility in the 2020s. My second project with this system was to take advantage of some of the most cutting-edge tech of 2012 to see how well it coped with 4K gaming, a resolution standard that was made official at the end of that year. The first batch of upgrades to the sex machine included swapping the 24GB of slower DDR3-1333 sticks for 16GB of fast DDR3-2133 and, most importantly, swapping the graphics card. I exchanged the GTX 670 for a 690, a dual GPU card that had enough teraflops to blitz through early 2010s games at 4K. Like its first incarnation, however, the original 4K PC couldn't keep up with the times. Four hyper-threaded cores are still barely relevant in 2023, and 16GB is still an acceptable amount of RAM, but the GTX 690 still had the same limitations as the 670. Only DX11 feature support, atrocious Vulkan performance, and only 2GB of VRAM per GPU. In fact, it even brought its own baggage with it, that being the reliance on SLI multi-GPU technology for half of its performance. This tech, along with most other multi-GPU standards, didn't last out the 2010s. If I'd built this gaming PC in 2012 with the intent of running it for the next decade, I'd probably have endured about four or five years before feeling like I'd made a horrible mistake. Of course, in reality, I'd probably have been pretty satisfied with the PC for the first couple of years, and by 2013, I doubt most people would have been ready to upgrade just yet. Let's just say, though, for the sake of argument, I'd come into some money. Maybe my redundancy pay came through from the job that laid me off the previous year, and unlike the 36 megapixel DSLR I bought in the real timeline, I spent that windfall on some of the best PC upgrades available at the time. I asked my community for some feedback on which CPU I should put in the sex machine for our 2013 upgrade, and the poll winner was the 6-core, 12-thread i7-4930K. This pretty much mirrors what I can imagine I'd have done IRL. Socket 2011 worked with the Sandy Bridge E3000 series, which was still available brand new in 2013, but the Ivy Bridge E4930K was almost half the price of the top-end 3970K and had better single-core performance than the cheaper 3930K or my existing 3820. With a 12MB cache instead of the 3970X's 15MB, the Ivy Bridge chip performs a little slower at the same clocks, but not enough to justify the extra cost at the time. The motherboard, as in the previous video, is the Gigabyte X79 UD3. I had a hell of a job updating the firmware to support Ivy Bridge CPUs and modern GPUs. Out of the box, it didn't support the 4000 series, and wouldn't run a GPU more recent than the GTX 600s. 
Despite this F20 BIOS being the most recent one available, the motherboard still doesn't support the Xeon E5 2670 or 2680V2 I've tried out so far, but thankfully the i7 4930K is fully compatible. The RAM installed remains the same as in the 4K video, two pairs of DDR3-2400 running at 2133CL11. When it comes to finding performance RAM from this era, beggars can't be choosers. I usually buy mine from CEX and they don't tend to tell you specifics about brand, model and latency. I consider myself lucky to have acquired two matching pairs, even if mixing black and orange heat spreaders isn't particularly aesthetically pleasing. Sorry, tech dweeb. The X79 board and i7 Xtreme CPU mean that this RAM runs in quad channel, effectively twice the bandwidth of using the same RAM in dual channel. For storage, I'm once more using a 120GB 2012 era boot SSD, paired with a modern external 1TB SSD for games. Solid state drives of this capacity did exist in 2013, but weren't practical for someone on even an enthusiast's budget. A 960GB SATA model would have set you back about £500 and a 1.2TB PCI Express card, a predecessor to the M.2 drives we see today, would have cost in the region of £5,000. IRL, I'd obviously have been satisfied with the original 1TB 3.5-inch hard drive that I'd have bought for about 50 quid. but for the sake of my own sanity, I'm going to indulge in this one anachronistic luxury. The case remains the same, a robust Cooler Master HAF 912 with a colossal 200mm intake fan. This case has tons of room for drives should they be needed, though for my purposes I'd have preferred to have more room for an E80X motherboard. I have recently picked up an ASUS X79 board for testing Xeons, but sadly it doesn't fit in the case. I'd also like to have had room for a 240mm AIO, but unfortunately the motherboard's just a little too close to the top of the case for it to fit without some serious MacGyvering. The original Corsair TX650 power supply from the previous video didn't fit with my 2013 ambitions, so it's been upgraded to an EVGA 1000W semi-modular unit. Why the extra power, you might ask? Well, in addition to the fairly thirsty 6-core CPU, I've equipped this 2013 Extreme Gaming PC with the only GPU setup that made sense, a pair of Radeon R9 290X 4GB GPUs in Crossfire, rated at a combined 580 watts of power all by themselves. Yes, if you thought today's top-end CPUs and GPUs needed a ton of power, you're absolutely correct, but this isn't the first time in history that Bleeding Edge Tech has required a small fusion reactor to power it. The R9290X was among the first GPUs to natively support DirectX 12 features. While other GPUs of the era would later receive updates to let them run DX12 titles, their inherent lack of feature level support means that, for example, the GTX 780 Ti from the same era can't run some of the games that the R9290X had no problem with in 2023. Although AMD would go on to drop driver development for these GPUs eight years after their initial launch, community-made drivers are still available, making the R9290X still curiously relevant today. Of course, nobody gets to see ten years into the future before making their buying decisions, so staying in character as the poor, sweet summer child of 2013, I decided to invest in the ultimately doomed technology of Crossfire. Multi-GPU support faded away by the late 2010s, but my naive self wouldn't have known that. The cards themselves are mismatched. Again, I did my shopping at CEX, so I found myself with one reference model 290X and one aftermarket version from MSI. AMD's Crossfire protocol doesn't require an external bridge, so all I needed to get up and running was four modular PCIe cables to the PSU. And there we are, one hot, loud, powerful sex machine. It's not quite state-of-the-art for 2013, but still has specs beyond the wildest dreams of many gamers at the time. All in, it would have cost a little over £2,100 brand new, presuming you bought the hard drive instead of the 960GB SATA SSD. My total build cost back in 2022, factoring in the cost of the original PC as well as the upgrades, amounts to almost £500, though I think I could probably deduct about £90 for the value of the components I replaced. 
Whether it was two grand a decade ago or 400 quid last month, it's time to see if it was worth it. 2012's Far Cry 3 kept up the series' reputation for being demanding on hardware. Despite being a year old at the point this PC would have been built, it doesn't give the kind of ultra-high FPS one might expect. This could be down either to poor crossfire usage or a CPU bottleneck or possibly both. At 1080 Ultra, averages only manage about 85 FPS, with lows of 46. Reducing to very high had little or no effect on performance, and increasing resolution to 1440 only drops average FPS by 10 frames. 2013's PC gaming benchmarks were all about the newly released reboot of Tomb Raider. I actually just played the game through to the end of the main storyline over the holidays for the first time, as in the past, every time I tried to play it I got put off by all the QTEs. The built-in benchmark recorded a frankly astonishing 162 FPS on average, with lows of 116 at 1080 ultimate quality, with Lara's hair gloriously rendered in all its Tress FX splendour. Compared to the previous year's build, this is a revelation. That PC had to be turned down to Ultra and still only managed less than half the FPS. If Tomb Raider's frame rate was impressive, Bioshock Infinite's is astonishing. A stunning 2013-era game on 2013-era hardware, maxed out to the highest quality settings at 1920x1080, which I should point out was still a relatively high resolution at the time, managing over 200 FPS on average. I think this kind of performance would have sold anyone on this PC at the time. 1% lows were less impressive, dipping a little below 100 FPS, but unfortunately that's all part of the multi-GPU experience. In practical terms, Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor has a 100 FPS cap in gameplay. You can remove this cap with a mod to a config file, but if you had anything but the highest end PC in 2014, you might never have noticed. Nevertheless, the built-in benchmark tells me that the 2013 sex machine would be capable of 145 FPS on average, if the game weren't capped. Again, at 1080 Ultra settings, this is a pretty phenomenal result. The 2014 Call of Duty entry was a challenge for systems with limited VRAM, and by this point even 4GB was starting to look a little inadequate. The original build's GTX 670, with its 2GB frame buffer, could only run Advanced Warfare effectively at 1080 high, whereas the 2013 upgrade can deliver more than double the FPS at max settings. Averages are 170 FPS, and 1% lows drop to 85. The GTX 670's minimums were below 30 FPS, so clearly even high was expecting a bit too much. Given how Advanced Warfare was utterly demolished, I guess I'd expected more in GTA V. The previous spec could run the game at 1080 high settings at 80 FPS. The pair of R9 290Xs with their double-sized VRAM could handle settings cranked to very high across the board, but only gave about 14 more FPS on average and 9 more 1% lows. Looking at the afterburner overlay, it looks like the workload isn't fully utilising both GPUs. It's possible, but not likely, that this is a CPU bottleneck. Perhaps at some point I'll load up this pair of R9 290Xs into the MPG PC and see if a modern Ryzen can extract any more performance, or if the problem lies elsewhere. The 2013 Sex Machine tears through the original 2015 version of The Witcher 3, now called Witcher 3 Classic. I brazenly started benchmarking at 1080 Ultra settings, though I wasn't quite brave or stupid enough to enable hair works. The game averaged a little over 100 FPS, with 1% lows down in the 40s, because crossfire I guess. This average is more than double what the original spec PC managed at medium quality, though the 1% score is pretty much the same. 2016's Doom reboot has given me trouble before. The OpenGL API doesn't work well with multi-GPU setups, turning FPS into SPF whenever SLI or Crossfire are enabled. Vulkan doesn't seem to support multi-GPUs very well either. Like with some other titles I've seen so far, Doom doesn't come close to maxing out both GPUs at once, even at 1080 high settings. 
Nevertheless, the game managed a tremendous 116 FPS on average, even if it was only using about 1.3 GPUs to get there. As I found with the GTX 690, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice doesn't really care how much you spent on your fancy rig, it won't really use the second GPU. In this case though, it's literal. The second GPU is completely dormant and might as well not even be there. Still, for a visually stunning game released four years after the CPU and graphics card, the PC puts up a good fight. At 1080 high, it averaged in the high 50s and low 60s, though cutscene performance and heavy weather effects did drive that average down into the 40s. Arcane Studios Prey, on the other hand, uses both GPUs to their fullest, at least much of the time, driving a superb near 140 FPS experience at 1080 very high. This 2017 release is, however, one of the exceptions to the rule. By this time, multi-GPU support was waning in popularity among developers, leaving owners of Crossfire and SLI setups to comfort themselves with their 3D Mark scores. 2019's PC port of Red Dead Redemption 2 is one of the reasons why there are fewer games in this video than I'd have liked. 150GB downloads like this one aren't something I can do casually. The fastest download speeds I can get in my area are under 7 megabytes per second. Once it had finished downloading, I was then left with disappointment, but not surprise. Although the i7-4930K has proven capable of driving over 75 FPS when not GPU limited, the game can't fully utilise both 290Xs. With the quality slider set to the middle, my usual ride through Saint Denis recorded less than 50 FPS on average and looked a bit disappointing in terms of quality. Dragging the slider right as far as prefer quality helps refine the image detail somewhat, but sees frames drop to just above 30. By this point, the 2013 Sex Machine is six years old. It's had a good life, and it could potentially go even further with a GPU upgrade. If there's enough call for it, I might look at doing a final form. Let me know in the comments which GPU I should upgrade to next. Still, the reliance on Crossfire has proven to be this PC's undoing. The following results are from games released in the 2020s, and due to the lack of multi-GPU support, they will likely be equal to, or possibly worse, than I might expect to get with just one R9 290X. Unlike the GTX 670 from the original setup, the R9 290X doesn't need any upscaling tricks to get a decent frame rate in Cyberpunk 2077. In fact, I didn't even have to drop settings compared to some more modern GPUs. At 1080 medium, the one working card could drive 32 FPS on average. Sure, adding FSR could give a more palatable experience, but I'm of the opinion that you might as well play a different game rather than turn a visual spectacle like Cyberpunk into a soft, mushy mess. Last year's Elden Ring also does much better than you might expect. Again, you could get a smoother frame rate by making concessions in terms of resolution or quality settings, but I think the 290X performs admirably at 1080 high. The game pulls off a very acceptable 42 FPS, and was fast enough that I could pull off some reposts with relative consistency. Besides, even higher frame rates can't stop me from occasionally hitting the heal button by mistake, or rolling in the wrong direction, like a noob. Likewise, the God of War experience was pretty acceptable, all things considered. This game is a former PS4 exclusive, so it's always worth remembering that it was designed to run at 1080 30 FPS on hardware that was, in fact, a less powerful member of the same family as the 290X, and also that it doesn't always maintain a smooth frame rate on the console. In that regard, then, the Sex Machine is actually still up to the challenge, managing 48 FPS on average at 1080 original settings. The Witcher 3. Hang on, haven't I done this one already? Oh, no, wait, this is the brand new remastered update issued by CDPR just a few weeks ago. As well as adding many of the technical trappings of the modern gaming landscape, the remaster also continues the trend of ignoring multi GPUs. Which is a shame, because at 1080 high, this PC can still drive 52 FPS in the remaster, and if this new version of the game had a hypothetical perfect 100% crossfire scaling factor, 
it could actually pull off the same FPS as the original version of the game, though admittedly not at Ultra. Finally, let's end with a healthy dose of disappointment. On a few occasions I've seen Spider-Man Remastered do this exact thing on older or lower end hardware. It doesn't actually have an effect on the frame rate as measured by Afterburner, it's not a stutter per se, but the game just takes a brief pause to load in higher quality assets. This was at 1080 high, which stoppages aside allows for a 50 fps average, but anyone looking at playing this game on a 290x will probably want to drop quality a notch or two. This 2013 iteration of the Sex Machine has had a longer, more successful lifespan than its predecessor. It's a cliché you'll hear all too often from budget PC builders on YouTube, but these GCN2 cards really have held up over the years, beyond what one might have expected considering how sharply Kepler cards from this era fell off. The processor, too, has had a surprising amount of relevance. I did a deeper dive into both the i7-4930K and the R9-290X, pairing them with more modern hardware to see just how capable they actually are. Those videos are linked on screen about now. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.